welcome back to the Bridge the Gap podcast. This week we are having an interesting conversation with the wonderful Shelley at Sunrise Wellbeing. It was so, so lovely to speak with Shelley. Love Shelley. She's done an incredible job of creating Sunrise Wellbeing. And we're just really proud of her. We have so, so much in common and there's so many parallels, isn't there, with Bridge the Gap. So we explore that. The power of emotional literacy and delivering that proactively within the community, which is exactly what she's doing in a different part of the country to us. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting about this conversation is the fact that we touch a lot on children with additional needs. Shelley recently had an ADHD diagnosis herself and how that's helped her to understand a little bit about around what she has found difficult in the past and why, mm. but also that the importance of that long-term support of, yeah. you know, this, this can't be a prescribed do this with this child mm. and this will get this outcome. It has to be more organic than that. Mm. And, and we also talk in relation to that, that as parents, we often want to fix it and we want to have that prescriptive do this and your child will be fixed. Yeah. We do, and I can relate to that with my pair as well. You desperately want them to be okay don't you so we we explore that together in this podcast um and we also touch on burnout parents wise but also with staff in the education system and the absolute need for self-care not necessarily a lovely spa day great if no. possible which by the way we do need to book oh my gosh please. <laughs> um but just dripping that in through your day a bit of self-care breathing stepping outside for a moment going out for lunch yeah. walking down the road all of that is so so needed to prevent that burnout which is desperately definitely happening yeah. because we're talking about you know emotional education and it, interestingly it came up again about embedding this within curriculum and how important that is that in order to do that we have to be in a good place mentally ourselves and with that just support needs to shift so a really great conversation we hope you enjoy it and we'll see you again on the next episode hello hi shelley so we are we've already introduced you so we're really excited to have this conversation because we've actually known about each other and met up and chatted so much over the last I'd say two two and a oh, half years like even longer yeah, probably like three now isn't it yeah time flies yeah it is and you're doing amazing work in Leicester with everything that you're doing um at Sunrise Wellbeing and I suppose for me I did um I reached out to you, I did a talk at the Leicester Head Teachers Conference recently and there were a room full of teachers and TAs and mental health leads and none of them really were aware of, oh my gosh, there's this other support option out there that is emotional literacy based and that there isn't just a one size fits all. Tell us a little, a little bit about your background then, Shelley, and what made you kind of merge everything into this wonderful emotional health hub? Yeah, so I'd always kind of worked in special educational needs in education and I started off in sixth form college and then went down to secondary and then primary and then supported early years and some people kept saying to me, what are you going like backwards in age? And I used to say, but it's just through passion of going in, you know, sitting around in meetings and thinking, if only they had this support at this stage, or if only this family had this at this early intervention crisis point where, you know, they were trying to put in place strategies and support holistically. So that's kind of why I went down from kind of sixth form right down to primary. Um, and I think the passion just grew through supporting people with special educational needs, but the link with mental health, um, you know, they go hand in hand, but also that families were struggling and, you know, staff weren't always aware of how to support the young people or they didn't have the training. So then they were told, you know, you need to put in place this intervention and they weren't sure what to do. And then you'd be in kind of um, review meetings where maybe that wasn't being met and it was just it just frustrated me and I just used to think I need to I need to do something and I'd never been to university so when my son went to school that's when I decided right I think this is the time to do something so I took the leap and I left my job and I started volunteering 
And then, yeah, I did a, a foundation degree in children, families and community health. So I did that for two years. And then I was like, okay, well, I have a break now. And then I was like, no, I think I need to carry on on this journey to do more. So, um, yeah, and then I started my master's in integrative psychotherapy at Derby. So I did that for three years and actually finished that during the pandemic. So that was like my journey. Um, but through working with families and different children and young people, I'd always had this dream years and years ago of creating like a one stop shop. So a, a hub of support that you could go to where you could, if you were struggling yourself, you know, if you wanted to reach out and find out what services were available, if your child was struggling and you wanted to understand about anxiety and emotional literacy, but also have like other wellbeing things under the under the umbrella. So things like reflexology and yoga and mindfulness. So yeah, that was kind of in the back of my mind. It's been there forever. And it was just a dream really. And then um, in 2019, I'd already started my private practice as a therapist. And again, the need for that was just increasing. And then, yeah, I thought, I think this is the time. I need to take this leap. So was looking for a venue and every, everywhere that I was coming across was kind of based in the city. And I really wanted it to be kind of in a, maybe like a, a village setting where you people could come and it didn't necessarily look like, you know, let's all, let's come to counselling. It was kind of a safe space where people could come and access that support. So, yeah, I found a house. So this is early 2020, found a house, spoke to the landlord and he was willing to rent it to me on a commercial basis. Did a business plan, got a business loan. Was like yeah this is great and then literally signed everything got the keys this was probably february and then the world changed so then the pandemic hit and i was there with this extra house to pay for with this lovely business plan and thinking right what am i going to do now so i think it was one of well i'd say it probably is the most challenging thing i've ever done but i stuck with it and did a lot of breathing <laughs> affirmation it will be okay breathe count to 10 it will all be okay you know we definitely did know each other then before the pandemic because oh, we did yeah. yeah gosh time really does because fly. i remember when you got the building yeah. and we had a conversation then online afterwards yeah. and you were just in a place where you were like i've just brought this building I know what to do i do I know yeah so I think we connected via Twitter didn't we initially um, and again it was just so lovely to be in a community with people that like were your people that got what you were saying because sometimes you know in different roles in education or in businesses you can feel like you're the one banging that drum all the time about mental health and you get to a stage where people walk the opposite way because they think oh here she comes again she's gonna ask me to do something else um, so I think when I connected with yourselves and obviously you had experience of setting a similar thing up and passion for supporting, you know, the community. And it was just wonderful because I felt like, you know, at such a scary time. It was like, I'm not on my own. You know, and I think that is such an important message for everyone that, you know, you're not on your own. There are people around you. You know, people do care. And I just felt that you know, virtually. And then I remember we had, yeah, I think it must have been the start of the pandemic, we had our first Zoom because we were in lockdown. So that, yeah, and it was just so, it's meant so much to me to have you there in the background to go, okay, well, I can ask Jen and Nikki if I'm struggling with this or I can reach out to them. So yeah, it's been wonderful to have your support. Michelle, because it just aligns with so much, doesn't it? And what well, why Bridge the Gap was born, why we are banging that drum. And at times, and still at times now, it does feel like you're on your own sometimes and you're the only one who wants to make a difference. And, you know, we've butted heads a few times with certain kind of, well, I suppose systems, let's say, that have been really difficult to navigate, where you're desperately trying to make change and advocate for the child and the parent in that situation. And it feels like you're getting nowhere, but hearing you on that same kind of journey and being with it with each other and that sense of being not alone and the sense of belonging, that makes a difference. It keeps you going, doesn't it? It's that sense of belonging that Lisa yeah. Cherry talks about so eloquently. It's, it's when we connected on Twitter and I met so many wonderful people over Twitter because when I started, it did feel very lonely and that people were laughing almost at mm. me for having this, you know, dream around child mental health. 
So for so long, it felt so lonely. And then when on Twitter, you came up and I was like, there's the moon stars. There's a rainbow. <laughs> there's, who is this woman? I need to be her friend. Yeah. <laughs> because you were like, I'm not the only one. <laughs> you literally was like, these are, these are like a clone of, of me. And wow, they've got rainbows and moon stars. And it's like, it's amazing, all of this stuff. So yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So what made you, I suppose, working within that field then, you mm -hmm. saw the need and how there wasn't always a joined up approach to that support. And it can sometimes be very, this programme, you go on, whether that's CBT or something. Suppose you saw that and you saw that joined up kind of approach that was missing with the children that you were supporting especially children with additional needs because mm. so often they are turned away from other services um which is incredibly frustrating because we're talking about children mm. children amazing children what made you take action well I think there's a few things really and as you were saying I was feeling like my stomach was going oh it's bubbling up again all those things all those frustrations but that's why we do what we do because we want to make that that difference don't we so I think the first thing was that a lot of people were reaching out to the GP if they had the confidence to if they're at that stage and they were maybe they maybe felt like they didn't have the right support or they were placed on a waiting list and I'm talking like this is like five years ago when I was you know just starting out and so there was that kind of idea that they would go down the CBT route so they might be given say six weeks but then it could have opened up a whole other box of trauma a whole other box of stuff and then a lot of people were coming to to me that they felt like they then didn't have any support so it opened up these kind of wounds and then they were left with no strategies the fact that people were coming to me and maybe they had specialist assessment and they'd been diagnosed with anxiety disorder but they were sat in front of me and I was saying has anyone explained to you what anxiety is that it's normal that we all have it that you know it's there to protect us and they were like no I don't know what anxiety is so there was that and you know just having that conversation and normalizing anxiety and I could see a weight had lifted just within five minutes ten minutes of normalizing it for them to go I can't believe it's that we all have it, you know. I thought there was something wrong with me. Um, so there was that. But then through my work as well, I do training and I deliver workshops to organisations, schools, early years. And again, it was just that message that they didn't feel equipped to support the people in their care. And they themselves were struggling. So things like staff wellbeing and self-care, you know, maybe wasn't being focused on that they were given roles and they were again one person in a whole building that was trying to advocate for mental health but feeling I suppose like I had felt before that I was on my own so there was a few things really and I just thought we need to have this holistic approach it's got to be the support around the whole child because so often it's the child's labeled with it's your problem go off and go and fix it and what I know you are too, but what we're passionate about is going, okay, so what is this child's strengths? What are they amazing at? What are they interested in? What are their talents? And then let's think about, so, okay, so where's the challenges and the difficulties? And how can we use their strengths and their talents to support them, but so that they don't feel on their own? Because again, I was working with children and young people that were constantly in isolation, that were constantly being suspended and excluded. And it just breaks my heart. And even when I say, you know, the hairs stand up on the back of my neck because it's just reinforcing the message that they, they're not good enough, that they need to change, that it's their fault, you know. And I, I want to change that. That is one of the massive things that I'm constantly trying to raise awareness of when I do my training. And I work with teachers and head teachers that, you know, let's try and build emotional well-being into the whole curriculum. Let's not just say, okay, well, that child needs intervention and that child needs support let's build it into the whole day let's have sensory <laughs> you know let's think about the environment because actually you know sometimes I think they feel overwhelmed because again it's another thing they've got to do but what I'm always trying to bang on about is let's think about the, the little easy things that you can do during the school day just to allow everybody to feel safe and grounded because not everybody has had that experience and or, or has that experience within their home or, you know, in different situations. So I think we all benefit from that. And even staff, you know, if they're having those couple of minutes just to 
to breathe and to settle and reset. Um, and the impact of the pandemic has just been huge. So it's even more important now, more important than ever before to do that. Relationship focused, fun, safe exploration around emotions with with people who are properly trained, that, that's mm -hmm. that gap there, isn't there, around, you know, that understanding of how to explore emotions safely, what language is appropriate, but also the fact that stripping all of that back, like what you said, that at that head teachers conference, actually, I spoke about this, is you can focus on the long intervention as much as you want, this intervention that needs to happen. But if the culture of your school isn't saturated in kindness and understanding, then it's undone. How is the environment mm. a part of that co-regulation? You know, because we can co-regulate not just with people, but with the environment around us. When I walk into a room, if I'm feeling stressed, mm. that room can hold me. It can hold me and help me to feel safe. Mm. So in that feeling safe, again, if, if, and when I'm doing my training and my workshops, that's the thing that I'm always saying at the moment, that emotional safety, feeling safe, not just emotionally and in your mind, but your whole body, your whole nervous system feeling soothed is so key because we've all been conditioned for survival through a pandemic, you know, and, and I think, again, that's the other frustrating thing that I'm finding is that, you know, it's like this thing we don't talk about. It's like this thing that happened that we, we don't want to mention that that C word, we want to move on because that's in the past. But what we're seeing in reality is, you know, babies in nurseries that aren't settling or their their threat system is so heightened that they're bouncing off the walls and they can't sit for story time. Or like I said, in, in primary, secondary, you've got children that are maybe being punished for their adapted survival behaviour. And actually it's understanding that and going, right, let's not again punish the child and give them a consequence for this. Let's think about, you know, actually what we're seeing makes complete sense because of what we've been through. So again, it is about that relational support. It's about emotional education and building it in to the day, right from early years, primary, secondary, so that it's automatic, so that people know what anxiety feels like in their body. They know how it feels when they feel sad and they will feel more comfortable to sit with that emotion and express it. That is a huge topic that we talk about all the time. And in fact, we're doing a workshop on with the Derby head teachers, um, doing a talk around staff wellbeing in June. And I think what you were saying is that we need to be dripping this in, and we would absolutely agree with you, into the school day for not just the children, but for each member of staff that is sat with those big and difficult emotions for themselves as well because let's not be on let's not be beating around the bush here we are in a mental health crisis not just children's mental health but adults mental health as well all of us are struggling so if we can in some capacity weave self-care into the school day drip by drip by drip and model that as well for the young people that we're supporting that's hugely going to be beneficial and it doesn't need to be big, like you were saying, just tiny little moments in your day, just taking a breath, just scribbling on some paper, uh, having a sip of your cup of tea, whatever it might be. That matters, doesn't it? It's so important. And like you were saying about the environment, you know, you think about any any human being can be triggered and stimulated by anything, whether it's a sound, a tone of voice feelings memories anything connected to their senses so you know if you've got a staff member who's burnt out and stressed they're probably not going to have the same patience you know they maybe feel like they're at the end of their tether and their stress containers all over the place so self-care is so important and again it's there's this misconception that it has to be going on a spa day or doing something really fancy and it can just be let's just breathe you know, and sometimes people would say to me, but what technique shall I use? And sometimes I just say, you know, if in doubt, breathe out, because if you breathe out, you've got to breathe in. And yeah, over that's very true. Absolutely. You know, let's just breathe. Let's just take a moment and let's just be in that space where we can regulate. And like you were saying, co-regulation is so important. They have to have that model to them that they matter. I'm here for you. I'm going to hold you. I'm not going to punish you. No, this is unconditional.
Yeah, I'm with you, you're safe. Okay. We know what that's like as well here, both me and Jen. How do you do that in your day? Find moments of self-care for you. So my self-care looks a lot to other people like, that's just another job you're doing. That's <laughs> And uh, yeah, I'll share this with you, but I was diagnosed with ADHD a couple of weeks ago as an adult. Oh, no. Yeah, so my whole world now makes sense. <laughs> I've got a lot of permission to do the things that I do. And I've always known it, but I think just having that confirmation has really helped me. And I see it as such a huge strength because I would not be doing what I'm doing today without my brain working in that way. But my self-care is doing things like being in the garden, creating something. I love doing that, you know, creating something and looking at it and thinking, oh, doesn't that look lovely? Um, <laughs> I like walking. I, I have to walk. So I walk to work, I walk back. And, you know, that is a part of my daily routine. And that's where I can switch off and be mindful. And I appreciate the birds singing in the tree and things like that. But it's also a time where I do my most like productive thinking because it really helps me to just plan and think, OK, this is where I'm going. This is the path I need to do today. Um, yeah, so walking, um, gardening, I love. I love being with my friends and family. You know, I love planning things, fun things. I'm obsessed with fancy dress and face painting. So that is a huge thing for me. I'm always like, always like seeing, oh, that looks so exciting. Let's do that. That'll be fun. And that really helps me to be grounded. You know, if I've got something fun to focus on, my inner child's like, woohoo, let's go. We all need to reconnect to that inner child. We talk about this in terms of regulation and strategies that if in doubt for any of us or for any parents who are struggling or worried about their child, strip it back to play mm -hmm. and you know we all need that biologically we are designed to need play how we manage stress naturally so if we can go out and roll down a hill or run down a hill with your arms wide like screaming woohoo at the top of your voice or riding your bike when was the last time we all rode oh a bike goodness. for fun yeah. you know <laughs> There's so much to do, bouncing up and down on a trampoline, you know, do you know something? Spinning on your office chair. Yeah, I do like <laughs> to spin on my office chair. But something that I did, not was it yesterday? Maybe not yesterday, day before, I can't remember. But I've been, obviously, I've been on a health journey in general. And I've been doing my morning stretches and things. And my daughter was there and she was doing her stretches, which are very, very different to mine. So her <laughs> legs up there and she's doing her splits and her back bends and all of this. And then there's me doing, you know, one, two. <laughs> <laughs> but she did, um, just for fun, she did a forward roll. And I said, oh, I used to love doing forward rolls. And she said, well, do one then. I said, oh, I can't now. Like, I'm I said, why? I can't. I said, of course you can. I said, I'm scared. Isn't that silly? But I was scared oh, to do a forward roll because I don't trust my body after so many years. But anyway, I, I thought my daughter stood in front of me here. What, what do I want to say to her with my next action, with my next, next step? And it was, I'm going to do it. And so <laughs> I did it. And then I felt elated and I was like, oh my gosh, I love it. I want to do lots. So I just kept doing forward rolls around the room. And anyone who'd looked in thought, why is that mid woman in her mid 40s doing forward rolls around the house? But do you know what? That's playful, isn't it? It's having it fun, it's being play, and it's giving you that physical sensory input, it's helping your vestibular, your proprioception, which is something that children we're seeing post pandemic. Mm -hmm. Huge, yeah. there is a huge yeah. gap in that development and those eight senses it's like again raising awareness that we don't just have five senses we have eight senses and that connection with your body is so important oh, you like you said there about you doing you know you're doing rollovers and you feel elated you know sometimes we feel scared to just be silly you know think I'm a parent I'm a professional you know I'm I'm this, I'm that, but actually you're still you. And I think connecting with that. And if someone sees you being silly in the supermarket or someone sees you doing a forward roll somewhere, actually maybe it gives them permission to go, oh, I might roll down that hill or I might, 
like me, if I see a rope swing, I can't help but get on it. <laughs> I'm always silly. When we were in London the other day, when we were walking through, I was being silly. I like it. I think it does create permission does. for others to just have a laugh, to smile, to just, you can almost see that, you know, talking about the stress container there, but you can almost see when someone laughs, a little bit of stress leave their container. And you just mm. think, gosh, if you can bring a bit of that. And I just think we all need to strip it back sometimes to those basics, basic needs, mm. which is everything we talk about. And I know it's everything you talk about, but what are the areas of development that we're trying to support here? Because we're talking about mental health, but we're talking about people, we're talking about humans. So if we strip it back to biology mm. it really helps us to to find effective strategies that make a difference and understand those behaviors you're talking about absolutely because if you can back it up with some uh, evidence of neuroscience or this you're feeling like this because your brain is you know responding in this way or this is normal that your stomach's feeling like that because it's all connected and it's a way that your body's trying to tell you how you feel and one of the things that I always say to people is your body always knows before you do how you feel. But the disconnect between your body is present so much, isn't it? Because life's so busy. And I think, again, just going back to like what you were saying, it's about connection, isn't it? Because as a, if you're a parent and you're trying to support your child who is intense anxiety, maybe unable to go to school, go into social situations, you know, as a parent that's that's heartbreaking to see your anxiety gets in the mix because you just want to help and you want to take the pain away it's exhausting for you because we know with anxiety no reassurance is ever enough so that can be draining physically and emotionally so sometimes just kind of saying to yourself it's okay to just let's talk about something silly let's just go you know, let's just go to the park and do cartwheels or star jumps or put on some music and be daft, you know. Sometimes that's where the most powerful connections happen. And a lot of the time in our work as well, when we're doing emotional literacy work with children and families, you know, let's just make a puppet. Let's just make a, a worry jar. Let's make a calming jar. And it's there that you have the most powerful conversations because you're giving them that opportunity to feel safe and to feel heard and to feel soothed and it's there that that security is formed then, I think. With a safe relationship. Mm -hmm. So in terms of emotional literacy, because obviously we're an emotional literacy based service as well, what do you see as the value of having that early intervention of it being not therapy, as being emotional literacy, exploration, learning more about mm -hmm. everything you've just spoken about, of bodies, of brains, how we think, how that all links together, strategies. What benefit do you see of that over, for some children, over a more sort of clinical approach? Well, I, I just feel like it's absolutely crucial. I think it's a vital part that gets so missed because we have people come into us who are at crisis point, they've been to the GP, they've been referred for specialist services and they're on a waiting list or they're discharged <clears throat> because they're not bad enough you know they're not at that stage that's what they're told you know you, you're discharged but they then are left with nothing so even if you are on a waiting list for therapy you know what we're doing is we're trying to build our emotional literacy support through having one-to-one -one ELSA sessions which we've been so lucky to have our practice assistant qualify as an ELSA who's now doing that we have group workshops, we have Zen Dens, we have Teen Zens now. So it's just amazing because what you're doing is you're teaching them about their emotions, you're normalizing those feelings, you're allowing them to connect with their body and to gain more awareness and understanding so that they can feel more in control and catch those things earlier. But then also you might be working with the family as a whole or the parents or the carers to go, okay, so this is how maybe you can support them at home. But then ultimately, then you're teaching the parent, you know, you're saying, well, how does your anxiety feel when it kicks in? How does your happiness feel? What does that look like? Um, and visualising that as a colour or an animal or adapting to the child's interest. So, so powerful. But it's to me, it's something that should be literally in the curriculum right from early as you should. You should have it as a part of your education until you finish. 
at 18 it should be built in. I 100% agree with that, Shelley. And I think we see when we do our parent and child sessions in particular, you're teaching, like you say, you're teaching the parent a little bit because they've never had an emotional education. None of us will have had that in curriculum when we were younger and still not. I'm now. still having an emotional <laughs> education now. You yeah. never stop learning, do you? <laughs> yeah. So when you're when you're doing a session, delivering a session for a parent and a child together, it's so powerful because you're also facilitating a space for them to, to give them permission to talk about it with each other as well. And that's the feedback we get. Just normalising it is huge. And also granting permission to speak about emotions, not just for the child with the parent, but for the parent with the child. Yeah, teaching adults how to talk to children about emotions. Yeah. And also the power of asking an open-ended question and then just mm. leaving a space and mm. just leaving that in the air almost and then doing some colouring together or going for a walk and mm -hmm. that we don't have to always have the answer there isn't always a fix and often we shouldn't be trying to fix it and actually the child having a space to process those worries because they not, might not be an actual worry they might be a you know if we tend to worry don't we in the future a uh, future-based way so I know for me, what I find really helpful for me when I'm worried is someone to just listen mm -hmm. and not try and fix it because that escalates me. Because a fix it can be invalidating. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that can be a struggle for a lot of parents and carers as well. Because I know personally as well, your your gut will go into fix it mode very quickly, especially if it's your own child, because you, like I said, you want to take the pain away. You want to find a solution. And I think sometimes you can jump into that, can't you? And I know I have to work hard on myself to say, OK, just pause. OK, it's not about fixing it. It's about allowing that space to be heard. Like you were saying about hearing worries. You know, it, it's kind of understanding that, you know, it's OK if you feel like that. You know, we might not have all the answers now. We might not be able to fix it yet, you know, but we can work together and try and process it because, it's overwhelming, isn't it, when you're feeling all those big feelings? And that prepares them for if they do need therapy as well yeah. in the future. It's such a good backbone to be able to talk about something. You have to understand it. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a basic knowledge around emotions and what they are, then that really benefits. I mean, I remember being sent to counselling when I was in year 11 and there was a lovely counsellor at school. We went under the stage and I would sit there. And I remember sitting there for six weeks and just lying to her, telling her, I know what you want me to say. You want me to say this. And she thought I had such a good outlook that she asked if she could record audio, record a session for her supervisor, like her clinical supervisor. And I remember thinking, gosh, I'm really good at this. <laughs> at not being honest and open about my feelings because... I don't think I understood them. So when someone was sat there saying, tell me how you feel, I'm thinking, oh, I know what I need to say. And this is the outlook I'm supposed to have. And this is, mm -hmm. and I just think that emotional education from an early age, right from birth, there is so much we can do to wire those emotional pathways in the brain. Like you say, it's just needed and it's a drip feed approach. It's not mm -hmm. something that, Oh, we've done that tick. It's something that's needed as children's brains change, develop. There's, it's nuanced, aren't they? Emotions are nuanced and new experiences bring new emotions. And I would say about first love, how intense that is. And that brings up a whole other. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, you're, it's a never ending journey. Is it? It's not like six weeks and you're done. Or like, like we will know is, you know, we're in this role supporting children's mental health, but sometimes we get it wrong. You know, I know sometimes I might get angry and I might say something. And I think that was wrong. That's not really how the situation. But I think it's then about owning it and saying, you know, I got it wrong. It's OK. You know, I'm sorry. Because sometimes I think as adults, we feel like we can't own up to those mistakes. And like what you were saying as well about, you know, people will have their own coping strategies. And one of those might be, you know, don't show your anxiety, don't show that vulnerability, 
put that mask on, everything's okay, I'm fine. And, you know, a lot of young people will say that, even when they've been in therapy, you know, you've got to build that trusted relationship. So sometimes I'm fine is actually a protection because if I'm fine, nobody's going to follow it up with, oh, that that's, you know, scary, that's worrying, let's talk about it because you're fine when actually you, your whole world and your body might be saying otherwise. So, yeah, it's about having those safe connections where it can be really open and safe to discuss those things. I think that's so important. Right. Well, I think we've definitely got what drives you. I think this whole conversation has been <laughs> what drives you, which is absolutely brilliant. So we're ending this series of podcasts with a question that we're going to ask everybody. So the question is, Shelley, when you were a child, what do you wish you'd have been told? So what thing on your journey have you learned about that you're like, that would have made such a difference? And please share that with young people now who might be listening. I think the biggest thing, and this comes up time and time again, that I see now in my professional life, but one of the things that I would have wanted to hear is, it's okay, you're good enough and I'm here for you and I think it's so so powerful that and it's so crucial again that young people get that message because so often you feel like you're going crazy you feel like your world's falling apart you probably feel like you have got to put a mask on and you've got to fit you know especially as you're going from primary to secondary and it you can feel so isolated that it can cause you to withdraw or you know you're going to develop other coping strategies and that's one of the things that i think is is really important that message that you are absolutely good enough that you are not on your own that you're safe and that i'm here for you lovely conversation to have as always it feels like we've just recorded one of our little chats <laughs> chat. <laughs> but so helpful and such fantastic um advice for young people to know and you, they really are enough aren't they and we have been through a huge huge thing as a as a society you know the pandemic happened like you said at the beginning we need to talk about the fact that it's happened mm -hmm. and we need to talk about the restrictions that were in place and how they impacted us and the messages that children were receiving and how that impacted their development and their emotional understanding mm -hmm. and fears and all of those things and I think hopefully this conversation shines a light on why that that is really important we do bring that back out to the table to talk about yeah the more we talk and, about these things the more we normalize them and what's, yeah. what we can speak about is manageable. What we keeps in here is really tricky to uh, yeah. cope with if it stays in our minds. Shelley, thank you so much for your time. You're off on holiday now. So thank you for sparing the time on what must be a very busy morning. It's but have a wonderful break. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you, oh, thank Shelley. You, have Shelley. a wonderful holiday. Thank you so much. Take care. Wait, stop. You can still carry on the conversation. Don't wait until next week's episode. You can connect with us on all of the regular socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. And if you would like more support around your child's mental health, then why not visit our website? It's jwbridgethegap.com and we have so many different free resources for you. We have digital downloads, activity sheets, a very active blog, online free courses as well for you to work through at your own pace as a parent. But whatever you do between now and next week, please remember this. You matter. You are loved. And you are not alone.